Today, we're speaking about AI, public policy, and social impact with Lord Tim Clement Jones, CBE. What are the attributes or characteristics of artificial intelligence that make it so important from a policymaking perspective? I think the really key thing, you know, and I always say AI has to be our servant, not our master. And I think the reason that that is such an important concept is because AI potentially has an autonomy about it. I, if, uh, you know, uh, Brad Smith calls uh, AI um, software that learns from experience. Well, of course, if software learns from experience, it's effectively making things up as it goes along. It depends, obviously, on the original training data and so on. But it does mean that it can do things of its own, not quite volition, but certainly of its own motion, um, which therefore have implications for us all. And where you place those AI applications, algorithms, call them what you like, uh, is absolutely crucial because, you know, if they're black boxes and humans don't know what is happening and they're placed in financial services or government decisions over sentencing or, you know, a variety of really sensitive areas, then of course, uh, we're all going to be, uh, uh, the poorer for it. Society will not benefit from that um, if we just have this range of autonomous black box solutions. So in a sense, that's slightly a rather dystopian way of describing it, but it's certainly what we're trying to avoid. How is this different from existing technologies and data and analytics that companies use every day to make decisions and consumers don't have access to to the logic and the data in many cases as well? Well, of course, it may not be. If those data analytics are carried out by artificial intelligence applications, um, you know, there are algorithms that, in a sense, operate on data and come up with their own conclusions without human intervention. Uh, they have exactly the same characteristics. But the issue for me is this autonomy aspect. Uh, you know, data analytics, if you've got, you know, actual humans in the loop, so to speak, then that's fine because, uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, we, as you know, have slightly tighter, well, considerably tighter data protection uh, in Europe. But, you know, there are, uh, there's a framework for decision making uh, when you're using data and, you know, the aspect of consent or uh, 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 using sensitive data, you know, a lot of that is covered. So one has a, a kind of reassurance about that, that there is um, if you like, a regulatory framework. But when it comes to, you know, automaticity, it is much more difficult because, you know, at the moment, uh, uh, you don't necessarily uh, uh, have, uh, have uh, duties relating to the explainability of algorithms or the freedom from bias of algorithms, for instance, uh, in terms of the data that's input or the decisions that are made. Um, that You don't necessarily have an overarching rule that says, you know, AI must be developed for human benefit and not, uh, if you like, for human detriment. So um, there are a number of kinds of areas where which are not covered uh, by regulation, and yet there are high-risk areas that we really need to think about. You focus very heavily on this notion of algorithm, algorithmic decision making. Please elaborate on that. What you what you mean by that, and also the concerns that you have. Well, it's really interesting because actually quite a lot of the uh, examples that one is trying to avoid come from the states. So, for instance, you know, parole decisions or uh, decisions, of, uh, you know, in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, 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 the live facial recognition technology using artificial intelligence. You know, sometimes you get biased decision making uh, of a, uh, you know, discriminatory nature in racial terms or uh, you know, that was certainly true in Florida with the Compass uh, parole system. It, it's, it's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, places like Oakland and Portland and so on, uh, San Francisco have banned live facial recognition uh, technology in their cities. So um, those are the kinds of, of aspects which, you know, you, you, you really do need to uh, uh, have a very clear idea of how you design these AI applications what data you're putting in, 
uh, how that uh, data trains the algorithm and then what the output is at the end of the day. So it's really trying to get, you know, it, uh, some really clear uh, framework for this. Could, you can call it an ethical framework. Um, uh, many people do. I, I call it just, in a sense, a set of principles that you should basically put into place for, uh, if you like, the overall governance, for the design, and for the use cases that you're going to uh, use for the AI application. And what is the nature of the framework that you use? And what are the, the challenges associated with developing that kind of framework? I think one of the, the most important aspects is that this needs to be, you know, cross-country. This needs to be international. Um, but, you know, my um, uh, desire at the end of the day is to have a, a framework which in a sense, assesses the risk. I'm not a great regulator. I don't really believe that, you know, you've got to regulate the hell out of AI. You've got to basically be quite forensic about this. You've got to say to yourself, what are the high risk areas that uh, are in operation? Then it could be things like uh, live facial recognition. It could be uh, financial services. You know, it could be um, certain quite specific areas where there are high risks of infringement of privacy or uh, decisions being made in a biased way which have a huge impact on you uh, as an individual or indeed on society because you know social media uh, algorithms and uh, are, are certainly not free of issues to do with disinformation and misinformation but basically it starts with an assessment of what the overall risk is uh, and then uh, depending on their level of risk, you say to yourself, okay, a voluntary code, fine, you know, for certain things in terms of ethical uh, principles applied. But if it's if the risk is a bit high, you say to yourself, well, actually, we need to be a bit more prescriptive. We need to say to companies, to corporations, look, guys, uh, you need to be much clearer about the standards you use. And there are some very good international standards bodies. So you, you prescribe the kinds of standards for design and assessment of use case audit, impact assessment, and so on. But there are certain other things where you say, I'm sorry, but the risk of, you know, uh, uh, sort of detriment, if you like, or damage to civil liberties or, you know, whatever it may be is so high uh, that actually what we have to have is uh, regulation. And you say to yourself, then you have a framework. You say to yourself, you can only use, for instance, live facial recognition in this context. You And you must design your, uh, application in this particular way. So, you know, I'm a great believer in 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 a sort of gr gr graduation, if you like, of uh, 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 regulation, depending on the risk. And, you know, to me, it seems that we're moving towards that internationally. And I, and I actually believe that the new administration in the States will, you know, move forward in that kind of way as well. Uh, you know, it's the way of the world. Otherwise, we don't gain public trust. So the issue of trust is very important here. Uh, would you elaborate on that for us? There are cultural issues here. One of the examples that we used in our original House of Lords report was GM foods. You know, there's a big gulf, as you know, between the, the approach to GM foods in the States and, and in Europe. In Europe, we sort of have reacted and said, oh, no, 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 we don't like this new technology, we're not going to have it, and so on and so forth. Well, it was handled extremely badly because it looked as though it was just a major U.S. corporation, you know, wanted to have uh, uh, it, its uh, sort of monopoly over seed production, you know, and it wasn't even possible for farmers to grow seed from seed, uh, you know, and so on. And uh, 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 so, in a sense, all the messages were got wrong. There was no overarching ethical approach to the use of GM foods and so on. And we're determined not to get that uh, wrong this time. And, uh, you know, the reason why GM foods didn't take off in Europe was because basically the public uh, uh, didn't have any trust. They believed, if you like, an awful lot of uh, the frankly myths that were surrounding GM foods. I mean, it wasn't all myth. There's, there, you know, it, they weren't convinced of the benefit. Nobody really explained the societal benefits of uh, GM foods. Uh, uh, whether it would have been different, I don't know. Whether those benefits would have been seen to outweigh, you know, some of the dangers that people foresaw, I don't know. But certainly, we did not want this kind of 
uh, approach to uh, take place with artificial intelligence. And of course, artificial intelligence is a much broader technology. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't talk about artificial intelligence, talk about machine learning or uh, probabilistic uh, learning or, you know, whatever it may be. But AI is a very useful overall description, in my view. How do you balance the competing interests, the interests of, for example, in the genetically modified food example you were just speaking about, the interests of consumers, the interests of seed producers and, and so forth? I think it's really interesting because I think you have to start with the data. And, um, you know, you can have a set of principles. You can say uh, that app developers, you know, need to look at the public benefit and so on and so forth. But you know, the really real acid test is the data that you're going to use uh, to train uh, uh, the AI, the algorithm, whatever you may describe it as. And uh, that's the point where um, there is this really difficult um, issue about, you know, what data is it legitimate to extract from individuals? You know, what data uh, it should be public, uh, publicly um, valued and not um, sold, you know, um, by individual companies or the state or whatever. And it is a, a really, you know, difficult issue. I mean, you know, in the States, you've had that um, a brilliantly written book, uh, uh, Surveillance Capitalism uh, uh, by uh, Shoshana Zuboff. You know, now those really raise some really important issues. You know, should an individual's behavioral data, not just ordinary personal data, but their behavioral data be extractable uh, and usable and treated as part of a data set. And so that's why there's so much more discussion now about, well, what value do we attribute to personal data? How do we curate um, personal data sets? Um, can we find a way of not exactly owning, but certainly controlling to a greater extent, the data that we impart? And is there some way that we can sort of extract more value from that in societal terms? And I do think we have to look a bit more, um, uh, and certainly in the UK, we've been very keen on what we call data trust or social data foundations, but institutions that hold data, public data. For instance, um, you know, our National Health Service, obviously you have a different health service in the States, but, you know, data held by a National um, Health Service could be held in a data trust and therefore, and people would see what the the framework for governance was. And this would be, you know, actually very reassuring in many ways um, for people to see that their data was simply going to be used back in the health service, or if it was um, uh, exploited by third parties, that that was again for the benefit of the National Health Service, you know, vaccinations or uh, 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 diagnosis of um, rare diseases or whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's really seeing, you know, the value um, of that data and not just seeing it as a commercial commodity um, that is taken away by a social media platform, for instance, and exploited, you know, without any uh, real um, accountability. And, you know, arguing that terms and conditions do the job uh, it doesn't ever, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I still don't believe that terms and conditions are, are adequate in those circumstances. We have a very interesting question from Arsalan Khan, who's a regular listener and contributor to CXO Talk. So thank you, Arsalan, for always for all of your great questions. His question is very insightful and I think also uh, relates to the business people who, who watch this show. And, and he says, how do you bring together the expertise, both in policymaking as well in, as in technology so that you can make the right decisions as you're evaluating this set of options, choices, and so forth that, you were, that you've been talking about? Well, there's no substitute for government coordination, it seems to me. I mean, the White House under um, President Obama had, you know, uh, uh, somebody who uh, really uh, coordinated quite a lot of this uh, aspect. Uh, there was, there has been under, in the Trump White House, uh, a, uh, uh, a an AI um, specialist as well. Whether I don't think they were quite given the license to get out there and sort of coordinate the effort that was taking place, but I'm sure under the new administration there will be 
uh, somebody specifically, you know, in a sense, charged with creating policy uh, on AI in all its forms. And the states belongs to the global partnership on AI with Canada, France, UK, and so on. And so I think there is a general recognition that governments have a duty to pull all this together. And it's, of course, it's, it's a big web. I mean, you've got all those academic institutions, um, uh, you know, some powerful academic institutions uh, who are not only researching into AI, but also delivering uh, solutions in terms of ethics and uh, risk uh, assessment and so on. Um, then you've got all the international institutions, OECD, Council of Europe, uh, G20. Um, but then at national level, you know, we've got, uh, uh, we've in the UK, for instance, we've got regulators uh, of data. We have uh, um, an advisory body that advises on AI and data and innovation. Um, we have an office for AI in government. Um, we have a, an Alan Turing Institute, which pulls together a lot of the research that is being done in our universities. Now, unless somebody is sitting there at the center and saying, how do we pull all this together, it becomes extremely incoherent. You know, I mean, we've just uh, uh, had a paper from our competition authority on uh, algorithms and the, the way that they may create consumer detriment in certain circumstances where they're misleading, for instance, on price comparison or, you know, whatever it may be. Now, you know, that is very welcome. But unless we actually bolt that all into what we're trying to do, uh, across government uh, uh, and internationally, you know, we're going to find ourselves with a set of rules here and another set of rules there. And, you know, actually trading across borders, uh, you know, it's difficult enough as it is. Um, and we've got all the data uh, shield and data adequacy issues uh, at this very, very moment. Well, if we start having issues about um, inspection of the uh, guts of an algorithm before an export can take place, uh, because we're not sure that it's, you know, uh, uh, conforming to our particular set of rules in our country, then I think that's going to be quite tricky. So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, in elevating this and making sure that right across the board, uh, we've got some common, uh, uh, a common approach. And that's why I'm such a big fan of this risk based approach, because I think it's common sense, basically. Uh, and it doesn't have one size fits all. And I think also it, 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 it means that uh, culturally, I think we can all get together on that. Is there a risk of not capturing the nuances because this is so complex and therefore creating regulation or even policy frameworks that that are just too uh, broad brushed? There is a danger of that, but frankly, um, uh, I think at the end of the day, you, you know, whatever you whatever you say about this, they're going to be tools. I, I think regulation is going to happen at uh, sector level, probably. But, but and I think the, so I think that it's fair enough to be relatively broad brush across the board in terms of, you know, risk assessment and the general principles to be adopted in terms of design and so on. You've got people like the IEEE who are doing, you know, ethically aligned design standards and so on. It's when it gets down to the sector level that I think then you get more specific. And I don't think, you know, most of us would have too much objection to that. And after all, alignment by sector, you know, for instance, the rules uh, relating to financial services in states, you know, for instance, in um, mergers and takeovers and stuff, aren't very different uh, to those in the UK. But, you know, there is a kind of, uh, a, a, a sort of competitive drive towards aligning your regulation and your regulatory uh, uh, rules, so to speak. And I, so I'm, I, I'd be quite optimistic that actually, you know, if we saw that, um, uh, or if you saw that there was one type of regulation in a particular sector, you know, uh, you'd go for it. I mean, uh, automated vehicles actually is a is a very good example where regulation can actually be a positive driver of growth because you've got a set of standards that everybody can buy into and therefore there's business certainty. Arsalan Khan comes back with another question, a very interesting point against uh, or talking about uh, the balancing of competing goals and interests. If you force open those algorithmic black boxes, 
then do you run the risk of infringing the intellectual property of the businesses that are doing whatever it is that they're doing? Regulators are very used to dealing with these sorts of issues of inspection and audit. Um, and uh, I think that, um, you know, that it would be perfectly fine uh, for them to, uh, to do that. And they wouldn't be infringing intellectual property because they wouldn't be exploiting it. You know, they'd be inspecting, but not exploiting. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, that's fine. And also, don't forget, we've got this great concept now. Regulators are much more flexible than they used to be of sandboxing. How do you balance the interests of corporations against the public good, specifically when it comes to AI? And maybe give us some specific examples. You know, for instance, we're seeing that in the online uh, uh, situation with social media. Uh, you know, we've got this big debate happening, for instance, on uh, whether or not it's legitimate for Twitter to uh, delist somebody, you know, in terms of their account with them. And, you know, no doubt the same is true with Facebook and so on. Now, you know, I don't think it's, I mean, maybe I shouldn't talk about it not being fair to a social media platform to have to make those decisions. But I would much prefer to see, uh, because of all the freedom of speech issues, I'd much prefer to see a reasonably clear set of principles and regulations as about when social media platforms actually ought to delist somebody. Uh, and, you know, we're developing that in the UK in terms of online arms so that you know, social media will have certain duties of care uh, towards certain parts of the community, particularly young people and the vulnerable. And, you know, they will have a duty to uh, to actually not uh, uh, to delist or or take off content or uh, what uh, has been called detoxing the algorithm. You know, we're going to try and get a set of principles where people are protected, but uh, and social media platforms have a duty, but it isn't a blanket. And it doesn't mean that social media have to make freedom of speech decisions in quite the same way. Um, so, you know, it, but inevitably, public policy is a balance. And the big problem is ignorance. You know, it's ignorance on the part of, you know, the social media platforms as to why we would want to regulate them. And it's ignorance on the part of politicians who actually don't understand the niceties of all of this. Uh, when they're trying to regulate. And, you know, as you know, uh, uh, you know, some of us are quite dedicated to joining it all up. So people really do understand uh, why we're doing these things and um, getting the right solutions. And getting the right solution in this online area is really tricky. And of course, at the middle of it, and this is why it's relevant to AI, is the algorithm, is the pushing of messages in particular directions which are autonomous i mean we're back to this autonomous issue michael um and you know quite sometimes you need to say i'm sorry you need to be a lot more transparent about how this is working um and uh, it shouldn't be working in that way and you're going to have to change it now i know that's a big big change of culture in this area but it's happening. And I think that, um, you know, with the new administration and Congress and so on, I think it will all be on the same page fairly shortly. I have to ask you about the, the concentration of power that's taken place inside social media companies. And if we think, you know, social media companies, many of them born in San Francisco, technology, uh, technology central. And so the culture of of technology historically has been, well, you know, we create tools, it's beneficial for everyone, and leave us alone, essentially. Well, that's exactly where I'm coming from, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, that culture has to change now. And there is an acceptance. I think that, um, you know, if you talk to the senior people in the social media companies in the big platforms, you know, they will now accept that actually, you know, the responsibility of having to make decisions about delisting people and so on, um, uh, or what content is not, it, it, it should be taken down, is not something they feel very comfortable about, you know, and they're getting quite a lot of heat as a result of it. And therefore, you know, I think increasingly they will welcome regulation. Now, you know, we, obviously I'm not predicating uh, what kind of regulation is appropriate um, outside uh, the UK or will, what would be accepted. But 
certainly that is the way it's wor worked with us. And there's a huge consensus across parties that we need to have a framework for the social media operations, that it isn't just, you know, we, Section 230, as you know, uh, sort of more or less allows anything to happen in that sense. You don't take responsibility as a platform. Well, you know, not that we've ever accepted that in full in, in Europe, but in the UK, certainly, uh, you know, now we think that it's time for social media platforms to take responsibility and, you know, but recognizing the benefits. I mean, you know, good heavens, I tweet like the next person. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, you know, I'm no longer on Facebook. I, I took uh, Jared Lanier's advice. But, you know, uh, it, it, there are uh, uh, platforms that, um, you know, are out there, which are the Wild West. You know, we've heard about Parler um, uh, as well. So, you know, um, that we need we need to pull it together pretty quickly. Actually, we have some questions from Twitter. Uh, number, let's just let's just start going through them. I love taking questions from Twitter; they tend to be great questions. So, you created uh, the House of Lords AI report. Uh, were there any outcomes that resulted from that? What did those outcomes look like? Somebody asked me, said, what was the, uh, the, the least expected uh, outcome? I expected the government to listen to what we had to say. And, you know, by and large, they did uh, to a limited extent in terms of coordination. They didn't, they haven't moved very fast on skills. You know, we're uh, going to touch on skills. They haven't moved far, nearly fast enough on skills. They haven't moved fast enough on education and digital understanding, although we've got a new uh, kind of media uh, uh, literacy uh, uh, strategy coming down the track in the UK. Uh, and some of that is due to the to the pandemic. But actually, you know, it's a question of energy and 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 so on. Uh, they've, they've certainly done well in terms of uh, 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 the climate, in terms of research, investment, and in terms of uh, the kind of near nearer to market type of encouragement uh, that they've given. Um, so, you know, I would score their card at about six out of 10. So they've done well there. But the really interesting aspect, uh, and they sort of, you know, said, yes, we accept your ethical AI, your trustworthy AI message, which was at the core of what we were trying to say. And they also accepted the diversity message. And in fact, if I was going to say, what where they perform best in terms of taking it on board it's this diversity in the ai workforce uh which i think is the biggest biggest uh, plus but the really big plus has been the way the private sector in the uk has taken on board the messages about um, trustworthy ai ethical ai you know um now tech uk which is our you know overarching trade body uh, in the uk they now have a regular annual conference about ethics and AI, which is fantastic, um, you know, and they are genuinely uh, engaged um, uh, uh, and, you know, in a sense, the culture of the app developer, the AI app developer really, uh, you know, encompasses ethics now. Um, you know, we don't have a kind of Hippocratic oath for developers, but certainly the expectations are that uh, developers are much more plugged in uh, to the principles by which they are designing uh, artificial intelligence and you know i think that will continue to grow and the education role that tech uk have played with their members has been fantastic and you know there's a general expectation across the board uh, by our regulators and you know we've reinforced each other i think probably in that area which i think you know is, has been very good because let's face it the people who are going to develop the apps are the private sector the public sector by and large procure these things they've had you know, sets of ethical principles now for procurement that they put in place, World uh, Economic Forum principles, uh, data uh, uh, sharing frameworks and so on, or ethical data sharing frameworks. So uh, generally, I think, you know, we've uh, we've seen, you know, a fair bit of progress, but we did, you know, um, point up in our just most recent report uh, where, you know, they should, they, they, they ran the risk of being complacent and uh, we warned against that basically. We have a really interesting question from Wayne Anderson, and Wayne makes the point that it's difficult to define digital ethics at scale because of the competing interests across society that you've been describing. 
He said, who owns this decision-making ultimately? Is it the government? Is it the people? How does it manifest? And what, who decides what AI is allowed to do? That's exactly my risk-based approach. It depends what the application is. You know, you do not want a sort of big brother type government approach to every application of AI. That would be quite, quite uh, stupid. You know, uh, they couldn't cope anyway, and it would just be, uh, restri- it would restrict innovation. So what you have to do, and this is, you know, back to my uh, risk assessment approach, you have to say, what are the, you know, the, the areas where the potential of detriment to the citizen, to the consumer, uh, to society, you know, what are those areas? And then what do we do about them? You know, what are the highest risk? And I, you know, think that is a proportionate way of looking at, uh, at dealing with AI. And it's really, you know, that is, that is the way forward for me. And I, I think it's something we can agree on, basically, because risk is something that we understand. Now, we don't always get the language right, but, you know, that's something I think we can agree on. And Wayne Anderson follows up with another very interesting question. And he says, when you talk about machine learning and statistical models, it's not soundbite friendly. To what degree is ignorance of the problem and the nature of what's going on and the media inflaming the, the challenges here? The narrative of AI is one of the most difficult and the biggest barriers to understanding, public understanding, understanding by developers and so on. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we're victims in the West of a sort of 3,000 year old uh, narrative. You know, I mean, Homer uh, wrote about robots, uh, 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 Jason uh, and the Argonauts, you know, um, had to uh, escape from a robot uh, walking around um, uh, the Isle of Crete. You know, that was uh, uh, 3,000 years ago. It's been in our myths. We've had Frankenstein, the Prague Golem, you know, you name it. We are uh, 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 frightened, societally, existentially frightened by other, by the other, by alien creatures. And, you know, if we in, if we think of AI as embedded uh, in uh, uh, physical form in robots, then, you know, and this is the trouble, you know, we've seen headlines about Terminator robots. I mean, you know, for instance, uh, when we launched our House of Lords report, we had headlines about uh, House of Lords saying there must be an ethical code to prevent Terminator robots. I mean, you know, um, you can't get away from the narrative. So you have to double up, keep doubling up on the uh, public trust uh, in terms of uh, the reassurance about the principles that are applied, about the benefit of the uh, 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 of AI uh, applications and so on. I mean, and this is why I raised the GM Foods point because we, there's a, you know, let's face it, without much narrative about GM Foods, they were called Franken Foods, but you know, they didn't have a thousand years of history about aliens. Uh, but we do in AI, so the job is bigger. Any conversation around AI ethics must include a discussion of the economic impacts of AI on society and the dis- displacement, worker displacement and economic displacements that are taking place. How do we bring that into the mix? There are different forecasts and we have to accept the fact that some people are uh, you know, uh, very pessimistic about the impact on the workforce of artificial intelligence, you know, uh, and others who are much more sanguine about it. But there are choices to be made. Um, and we have been here before. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, Fifth Avenue in 1903, uh, what do you see? You see all horses. If you look at Fifth Avenue in 1913, uh, you see all carriages. I think you see one horse uh, in the photograph. And, you know, this is something that society can adjust to, but you have to get it right in terms of reskilling. And one of the big problems is that we're not moving fast enough. Um, and not only is it about education in schools, um, which is not just um, scientific and technological education, it's about how we use AI creatively, how we use it to augment what we do, to add to what we do, not just simply substitute for what we do. So there are creative ways we need to learn about uh, in terms of using AI. 
Um, and uh, then, of course, we have to recognize that we have to keep reinventing ourselves as adults. You know, we uh, can't just expect to have the same job for 30 years now. We have to keep adjusting to the technology as it comes along. And to do that, you know, you can't just do it by yourself. You have to have, uh, I don't know, uh, support from government, like a lifelong learning account, um, as if you were getting a university loan or grant. Um, you've got to have uh, uh, employers who actually make the effort to make sure that uh, their workers' skills don't simply become obsolete. You've got to uh, be on the case for that sort of thing. You know, we don't want a kind of digital rust belt uh, 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 in all of this. So, you know, um, we've got to be on the case. And it's a mixture of uh, educators, employers, government, uh, and individuals, of course. And, you know, individuals have to have the understanding to know that they can't just simply you know, take a job and be there forever. So again, it seems like there's this balancing that's taking place, for example, in the role of government in helping ease this, this set of economic transitions, but at the same time, recognizing that there will be pain and that individuals also have to take responsibility. So do I have that right, more or less? Absolutely. I'm not a great fan of the government doing everything for us because they don't always know what they need to do. You know, I mean, uh, uh, to expect government simply to solve all the problems with a wave of the financial wand, I, I think is unreasonable. But I do think this is a collaboration that needs to take place. We need to get, you know, our education establishments, um, uh, particularly universities and, and further education uh, in terms of co pre-university colleges and if you like, those developing uh, different kinds of more practical skills involved so that we actually have an idea about the kinds of skills we're going to need in the future. We need to continually be looking forward to that and adjusting uh, our training and our education to that. And I, the moment, I, I just don't feel we're moving nearly fast enough and we're going to wake up uh, you know, with a dreadful hangover, if we're not careful, uh, with people without the right skills, but the jobs, you know, can't be filled. And yet, you know, we have people who can't get jobs. So, you know, this is a this is a real issue. And I'm not one of the great pessimists. I just think that at any pace, we have a big challenge. We also need to talk about COVID-19. And where are you in the UK dealing with this issue? And as somebody in the House of Lords, what is your role in helping manage this? My job is to push and pull and kick and shove and try and move government on, but also be a bit of a hinge between the private sector, academia and so on. You know, we've got quite a community now of people who are really interested in artificial intelligence, uh, the implications, uh, how we further it. Uh, for public benefit, uh, and so on. And I want to make sure that, you know, that community uh, is retained and that government ministers, you know, actually listen to that community and are part of that community. Now, you know, I get frustrated sometimes because, you know, government doesn't move as fast as uh, we all want it to sometimes. You know, algorithm algorithmic decision-making in government is still, you know, government haven't, our government hasn't yet woken up to the need to, have a fairly uh, uh, clear governance and compliance framework, but you know they'll come along. Um, uh, but I just I'd love it if they were a bit faster. But you know um, uh, I, I'm, I've still got enough energy to keep pushing them uh, as fast as I can go. Any thoughts on what the post-pandemic work world will look like? Who I mean, this is the existential threat because the. Uh, if you like, the combination of COVID uh, and the acceleration of remote working, particularly, where, you know, light bulbs have gone off in a lot of boardrooms about what is possible now in terms of use of technology, which which weren't there before. And so if we're not careful and if people don't make the right decisions in those boardrooms, we're going to find, you know, substitution by technology of uh, uh, people taking place to quite a high degree without thinking about how the best combination between technology and uh, humans uh, works, basically. You know, it's just going to be uh, seen as, oh, well, we can uh, save costs and so on without thinking about the human implications. And 
you know, if I was, you know, you know, going to uh, uh, issue any kind of gypsies warning, that's what I'd say is that actually, you know, we're going to find ourselves in a double whammy after uh, uh, the pandemic because of uh, new technology being accelerated. So all those forecasts actually are going to come through quicker uh, than we thought if we're not careful. And any final closing thoughts as we finish up? You know, and I use the word community a fair bit, but what I really like about the, if you like, the world of AI in all its forms, uh, whatever we're interested in, skills, uh, ethics, regulation, risk, uh, development, uh, benefit, and so on, um, uh, is the fact that we're, we're, a, a, we're a tribe of people who are, you know, who like discussing these things, who want to see results, and it's international. You know, I really do believe that, uh, you know, the kind of conversation you and I have had today, Michael, you know, is really important in all of this. Um, uh, and, you know, we've got uh, na international institutions that are sharing all this. The worst thing would be if we had a kind of race to the bottom with AI and its principles, you know, OK, no, we won't have that because that's going to damage our competitiveness or something. I think I would want to see us collaborate very heavily. And they're used to that in academia. We've got to make sure that it happens in every other sphere. All right. Well, a, a very fast moving conversation. I want to say thank you to Lord Tim Clement Jones, CBE, for taking time to be with us today. Thank you for coming back. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Michael. And thank you to everybody who watched and particularly to those who asked such great questions. You guys are the best. You ask superb questions. So thank you for that. Before you go, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.